Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Healing Gardens. I'm very happy to be with you this morning to take you on a little tour of the gardens and to give you some ideas of how you could create your own healing garden. Now at Healing Gardens, I have about eight or nine individual gardens and each one has their own little theme. So we will begin in just a moment but first, I would love to give you just a short history on my relationship with nature and how I discovered the power of nature and its healing ability. So for me, I came to understand this through a cancer diagnosis. About 25 years ago, I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma with a uh, terminal diagnosis. So I thought, Wow, and my world stopped as I knew it, and I thought, I really want to know who I am, and so I just stopped everything. So all during chemotherapy, I sat on the front porch over here, and I would journal, and I would look at nature. And as I looked at nature, I began to see things in nature simple things that began to teach me about myself, about my life, about life in general, and about God. So after chemotherapy, I was too sick to go outside. I wanted to not just look at nature and observe nature, I wanted to be in nature. So I began to, an idea formed inside, and I asked my son, to rototill a large area of, of grass into what I thought would become a perennial path garden. And, and I'll show you that in, in just a minute. But what I discovered as I jumped into gardening and the creative process was that I found myself in what is known as Kairos time, which is to me, well, which it, Kairos is Greek, which means God's time and where there was no thought of cancer, no thought whether I would live or die, no thought if the chemotherapy is going to affect me somewhere down, down the road. And so this was wonderful for me. So I began to create um, garden after garden. And I also began to take a look at, at this, and I began to read some studies about our relationship to nature. And one study was done by Texas A&M University that said, when you're out in nature for five minutes, especially where there are trees, it lowers your blood pressure and also muscle tension. And then I read another study, and this was about uh, working in the rich black soil. And when you breathed in that soil, there are microbes in the soil that trigger something in your brain to create more dopamine or serotonin, which are the feel-good um, chemicals in our brain. And so when I would think about that old phrase, or adage, uh, the happy gardener, I thought this makes perfect sense. And then I knew that for a healthy, balanced, um, uh, a physical piece of, of me, I needed to keep my stress levels down. I needed to keep my cortisol levels in balance. And too much is not good and too little is not good. So I thought, okay, this is wonderful. So if you are to create a healing garden, you need to consider, number one, you need to consider the lay of the land. What do you have? How much space do you have? For instance, when I first moved here, when my husband and I first moved here about 45 years ago, um, in the front yard, there was just a round circle and there was nothing there but a dead tree stump. So I thought, oh, well, I'll just dig that out and I'll put maybe a bird bath and then I would plop some geraniums around the center and, and that was it. And then, in the back of the house, which I will show you, is, was a just huge rock garden. I'm sorry, a huge rock pile. And coming out of that rock pile were just a few um, 
uh, native flowers and uh, uh, old-fashioned phlox and I thought well I'll just roll some stones around here and just try to create uh, some levels so eventually that became a rock garden and then one more example in the very back of the house there is a round there was a round cement circle and that used to be the foundation for the old silo that used to be here. This was a working farm for many, many years. And growing out of that were, again, a few weeds and a few more old-fashioned flocks. So then I thought, well, I'll just throw a few more flowers in and be done with it. So you look at the lay of the land, and then you, you ask yourself a few questions. What is healing for me? What is healing for me? And how much time do you have? How much time? What can you manage? And so what is wonderful about creating a healing garden is that you can make it as large as you want or as small as you want. So we'll just walk over here just to, for me to show you that you can have a healing garden in a small area as a little window box or a, a big container on your patio. But on this window box I just I put a little concrete statue of a woman who is lying on the moon and she has such a wonderful expression on her face she's got a little angel on her toe and a little angel looking down protecting her and when I pass this I look at that and it feels really right to me and it's something that I would love to do and that I, and that I can do in nature so let's continue over here toward the little circle garden over here. So another question you can ask yourself is, what makes you feel relaxed outside? Do you like a lot of sound? Like for instance, the water coming off the fountain over here. Do you, would you prefer perhaps some wind chimes? Or do you feel more relaxed outside in silence, like just the sound of the birds or the wind in the trees or the crickets. Also, the whole idea of making a healing garden can have a theme and you might want to consider that. And I'll give you just a few ideas and in a little bit I will show you some examples of what I cho chose as my own themes. Perhaps you would like your healing garden, you would like a cutting garden. And so your healing garden is completely filled with flowers that you can cut and bring in the house for bouquets. Perhaps you would like a, a children's garden that would have maybe dwarf plants and little, um, which would include flowers like, um, like the snapdragon, where you, you flick off a little blossom and you make it talk like I did as a child. Uh, maybe you want uh, plants that have a very soft feel to them. And perhaps you are, you are absolutely in love with butterflies. So yours would be an absolute butterfly garden. There are some flowers that are more, uh, that butterflies are more attracted to. Or you could have a moon garden, and I'll show you that in just a minute. And that has a very ethereal feel to it. It's got, it's only um, white flowers, but I'll show you that in a moment. And perhaps fragrance is really important to you. So every flower in your healing garden and plant, you want to have a wonderful smell. Another example you might want is a memorial garden in honor of someone who has died, or perhaps a rose garden, or like myself, a rock garden. So let's walk over to the little circle garden here. And in this garden, I have replaced the original bird bath with this lovely fountain that was given to me by a friend. And in this garden, I have, um, I have some sun and some shade, a little bit of both. So that is a number one uh, criteria that you want to consider in your garden. And remember that when you buy plants, to absolutely check out the little tag on your plant, and, and it will tell you. So here I have perennials, uh, which come back every year, a hosta, and I have a corabel over here tucked in. This one is doing really well. This one is struggling, and another one over there. 
but always intermingled with, with my perennials. In most of my gardens, I have annuals because they have that wonderful lasting color all summer up until frost. Perennials only have a shelf life. Well, hostas have a long, <laughs> they'll stay that stay this beautiful all summer. But the flower, maybe uh, for all perennials, maybe two weeks or three weeks if you're lucky. So let's walk over this way. And we'll stop here at the pump house. As I said, this was a working farm and this little pump house was built over the well to protect the well and it's a hand dug well and this beautiful windmill was up of course has been up there for years and years the sails were always missing but around the, the pump house are uh, lily of the valley um, over here these are fiddle ferns they love love shade they can stand some dappled light and over here are old-fashioned phlox and all of these three plants are over oh my goodness over 80 years old they've been here forever they were here when we moved here and I'd like you to notice this little shepherd's hook here. This is what I do in many of my gardens. When I want a splash of color, I add a hanging basket. And what happens then, as you walk toward, you come down the lane, or you walk toward this area, this pops. And so then your eye takes in, takes in the whole picture. We'll walk over to the perennial path garden, which was one of my first gardens that I created with intention and my idea as I said was to make a garden that had paths because I wanted people to walk the gardens myself included and turn a corner and see something absolutely beautiful and in order to accomplish that I planted things of different heights. In other words, I did not put all my tall flowers in the back and then the medium and then the short. I, I have various heights all over so that you must walk in the garden to be a part of the garden, to see the garden. So we'll walk in and over here are my uh, one of my annuals that I love every year they're called profusion zinnias they bloom profusely and there's no deadheading just wonderful and then over here tucked behind this beautiful little um, plant called vervain that propagates by seed and this one Bal Baltonia that's just beginning to bloom right now are my state fair zinnias have to have them they are a butterfly magnet for sure. So I've got two clumps of these, one here and one on the other side of the garden. In your garden, in your healing garden, when you consider the question, what is healing for me? You can add different garden accents or elements to make it more your own. So for me, I love boulders, I love rocks, and I'm so fortunate because that's why this is called Stonehill Farm, because everywhere we tried to plant something big, we encountered a huge boulder. And they say that these were here from the Ice Age, or from the glaciers, I don't know, but there are many, and I'm so fortunate to have them. So I have a little boulder over here, and what's fabulous about this boulder is that it has a little flat surface that I have put a religious symbol. Well, it's a lamb, but for me, it's a religious symbol. Then all around the bottom, I have the lamb's ear, which you just can't help but break off a, an ear. And just to feel, the, it's like the ear of a lamb or a bunny. I wanted a clematis <laughs> in the garden, and it's, it needs a place to, uh, to climb. And so I added this little obelisk, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, 
so that it, it could climb and, and when it blossoms, it's, it's such a beautiful color, but it has come and gone. But right next to it, I have dahlias, which are, which will bloom profusely until fall. In every single garden I have ever created since cancer, the garden must have a bench. You must have a place to sit and be and to enjoy what you've created and to take in that healing presence, that healing energy of nature. If your garden space is very small, what I have done is, is I will clear out a small space right next to the garden and just remove the sod, just enough to put a bench, and then I put bark chips underneath the bench or some sort of mulch. So there must be a bench. So in every garden, wherever I could, there is a path of some sort, whether it's bark chips or, or flagstone, so that there is a path and it beckons you to come, calls you in. If you just happen to have a tree stump <laughs> or a tree that needs to be cut down, you might like to consider a carving of some sort. This was a black walnut tree and uh, it was incredibly toxic to whatever I planted around here. So I decided to have something carved into the tree and this is my Indian spirit looking over the land. And just an FYI, if you ever have that done, I was told to put sparvar, or sparvar is a polyurethane that are put, put on boats, but that is not what you would put on a carving like this. I was told that you take, that you use some um, uh, linseed oil. And so I've started to do that in the last three or four years, and it stopped the decay, hopefully for a long while to come. So here we are in the Memorial Garden, and when I was deciding to open the gardens to the public, I had been working in my field as a psychotherapist, and uh, after chemotherapy, this uh, young woman named Melissa was one of my first clients. Uh, and so I worked with her, and she was just filled with such a a wonderful childlike faith and I shared with her one day my vision of opening the gardens to the public and I told her I said and this was true I said that if I do that I know that an, another garden that I want to create is a memorial garden because it needs the memorial garden would symbolize the love that we give to one another and it's the only currency we have and I wanted to honor that. And so I was sharing all this with her and oh, she loved the idea. And I had an idea then, I asked her, could I, if I do this garden, could I do it in your name? And she said, oh, she would love that. So her favorite, I asked her what her favorite bird was. And her favorite bird, as the sign says, which is another garden accent you can have in your healing garden, is a sign. And this was a line that she wrote to her six-year-old daughter. Draw me a picture, sing me a song, dance me a dance, live. So her favorite bird was indigo bunting and calla lily. I tried growing calla lilies in here without much success, but I am able to attract indigo buntings, which is wonderful. So in her garden then, I wanted to have I wanted to pay attention to several things. For instance, I wanted a forget-me-not. And that's a little plant which is underneath the, hawth the thornless hawthorn. It has come and gone, but you can see little babies there. And that blooms in the spring. A beautiful little, little blue flower. It's just precious. And then I wanted to have some healing uh, plants because love is the most powerful healing force in the universe. So I have a little white echinacea here and over here a comfrey. This is, this is not 
blooming at the moment, but it comes and goes with its blooms, and it's what the settlers used for medicinal purposes. That's a very old plant. I have red bee balm in the back, and I love the red, which to me symbolizes love. And this is the wonderful thing about gardening. It's just full of surprises. This spring I was clearing out, and I noticed over here a little tiny plant about that big, and I thought, well, what's that doing? I don't recognize that, but it looked like something. So I left it. I decided to leave it. So this is one common sunflower. And it looks like the birds are having a feast here already. But how beautiful. And so I tell you, every year, every year, I have to have a sunflower here for the beauty and the brightness of this flower and the joy. So if you have uh, a tree stump, think about, think again about getting rid of that tree stump because it can be used for different purposes. When I first thought about creating this garden, there was a medium-sized tree here, which was beautiful, and I thought, this is perfect. It will shade the area. Lovely. Well, the year we opened in um, October of 2005, there was a horrible drought, and the very next year, this tree died. And I thought, do I cut it down? And I thought, no, no, I'm going to leave it. And it makes a perfect spot to put a plant. And uh, so I try to put a, I do, I put a plant there every year with trailers. And, and I love it. And then with my little angel looking down. Tree stumps also, I've cut them, I've left them and left them really short. So as people walk or I walk, I can sit on them. In this garden has a, another example of a garden accent such as the little crying angel over here. And it truly is very sad when someone dies. We miss them terribly. The grief is unbearable at times. But we also remember the gift of who they were and the love that we shared. In this garden, there must be a bench. And my boulder here that is almost completely covered by the years of mulch. The mulch I use, by the way, is mushroom compost every year. I love it. It's left the soil like butter. And when I can't use mushroom compost, I use a triple shredded or double shredded uh, mulch of some sort. So this is the rose garden and as you can see there is a fence all the way around it because we have deer and they love roses. And I thought, well, since I have to have a fence, I'll have a gate as well. So then I had a sign made, come in and rest and smell the roses. I want people to go in, to walk in. So let's walk in. So I have many different roses. Some are hybrids, <laughs> very susceptible to um, to diseases of one sort or another, but they smell so wonderful, I have to have them. And then I intersperse with knockouts, for instance, that are much more resilient and don't get, don't get diseases and just have that wonderful constant color. You see, I have another pathway so people can actually walk. It's like in the shape of a T. People can actually walk in to touch the roses and of course, my bench in the corner, absolutely critical. When you're in the throes of creating, sometimes it's hard to stop. And so once I finished with the rose garden, I thought, mm, I'd like a little appendage. I, I just I've always wanted a Japanese ma maple tree. So I've got a little Japanese maple here to anchor this spot. And so then I just started planting adding more. The little accent is a little iron gate. Well, the little accent piece that looks like a little gate and that makes a nice place. The clematis in the spring uh, will grow up there, up that piece and bloom. It gives a little height to the garden too. So as we're walking over 
to the old silo moon garden, you can see in this little tree, well, it's a big tree, it's a mulberry, it had a, a rather large opening. So I just tucked a little rabbit in there. And it makes for a little bit of a surprise. And growing around the base is a wonderful hosta that blooms in in August. The name escapes me at the moment, but very soon there'll be beautiful white flowers. So this is the old silo. Here's the foundation, the old silo moon garden. I turned it into a moon garden uh, after I saw an example of one. <laughs> and so as I said, it has all white flowers and I tried to pick flowers that would bloom one after another. So I have David Phlox, the white David Phlox in here, and Shasta daisies. My annuals here are white alyssum that, oh, are wonderful. They have such a fantastic smell. And over here, of course, being a moon garden, you have to have a moon flower. So this is a moon flower, and oh, there's, and it blooms at night, but we've got one beautiful, beautiful blossom. And you'll notice in this particular garden that there is a shot of yellow in the back. And that is a very common Illinois prairie flower called a black-eyed Susan. And it grows wild. When we first moved here, it was everywhere. But I have discovered that the deer love those as well. But when I, and these were in the garden originally, but when I went to all white flowers, I thought, well, nope, I'm digging it up and I'm gonna put it in a different place. So I did. And the next year it came back. I dug it up again and put it somewhere else. That went on for about three years. And finally, I just decided I'm leaving it because it just, this is where it wants to grow. It grows beautifully here. I love it. It's a wonderful cutting flower. And this also reminds me that I gave up a while back of having the gardens be perfect because it's impossible. And so one person who came to the gardens left and said, oh, your gardens are just beautiful. She said, they are perfectly imperfect. And I thought, oh yes, she just, she just nailed it. Just like me, just like you, we are all perfectly imperfect. In the very center of this garden is a very tall statue. And this is a, this is a fairy. And I thought, that if I were to create a moon garden, I would need a fairy because I had read as a child that fairies come out and dance by the light of the moon. And then above her is a beautiful sweet autumn clematis that's growing up on a lovely uh, half uh, trellis. It's, it's a semicircle and it will bloom in very, very soon beautiful little white flowers. It's just lovely with a wonderful, wonderful scent. And before we leave, I want to point out my bench that I carved out of the grass and with putting a little bit of mushroom compost on the bottom. And it gives us a wonderful view sitting on that bench, not only next to the garden, next to the moon garden, but also just looking down the hill. So we're walking toward the rock garden. When we first moved here, this was just a pile of rocks with a few of those flocks interspersed in that pile of rocks. And what we came to discover was that in the basement of the house, this, the, the original part of the house, years and years ago, the farmers used rocks from the field and would stack them and put cement as a foundation for the basement. And of course, they always used it for to line the sides of the well as 
they did for this old well uh, that in the pump house. And also we reasoned that all the boulders that they found in the field or around that they just kind of threw in this big pile. And so what grew out of this pile when we first moved here was a box elder tree. And the box elder tree, if you can see the little angel in a little cut off piece of uh, trunk of a tree, dead center here. And that's part of the box elder tree that grew out of that very spot. And the reason why it's so precious to me is that it grew out at a 45 degree angle that absolutely defied gravity. And it, it stayed that way for years and years until about two years ago. And it did just, it fell. And it was so beautiful because my children could climb the tree. And then when I started having retreats here, actually people would climb up it a little bit because it was very low to the ground. So I, I tried to remove the angel when the tree fell down and I couldn't, I couldn't get the angel out. So then I thought, well, it's going to stay. And so that has become part of this garden. And in digging out the roots of that box elder tree, of course, what do you know? They came across more rocks. So many. These three big rocks. A huge boulder over here. And another enormous one right here that now has flowers growing out of it. Right here. Looks like a lot of little animals lived in there over the centuries. And then all these little rocks all around. So in this garden I have the accent of a water of the sound of water, the little water fountain up on up on top. Um, I of course have my bench and stones that lead around. I have little pansies or Johnny jump ups they're called. Um, these little flowers that I planted last year in the, just the most precious circle around this lovely uh, tree that I had planted in place of the box elder. And it's uh, called a thundercloud. I believe it's a plum, a thundercloud. Beautiful little ring of these Johnny jump ups. And this year, when I came in the spring, they were everywhere. They were everywhere as per their name. They jump up everywhere. So here are my stepping stones that take you in into the garden. Consider grasses too as well for your garden if you love grasses and they have such a lovely feel and ethereal quality to them. They just, you know, they have a wonderful sway to them. I kept a lot of the old-fashioned phlox. They're one of my favorite flowers because as a child I used to play in them. And the neighbor down the street who was not very happy with me. You can barely see the rocks anymore. I have so, so much planted here. You can see them better in the winter. My little sleeping angel. By the way, you can put whatever element in the garden that you find is healing. You can, you can do a pink flamingo if that feeds your soul and makes you happy. For me, I probably have an overload on angels, but I love them. So we'll walk through the arbor here. This, is a, this was a, a gift, a Christmas present from my husband years and years ago before we ever opened the gardens. And it has now become the logo for Healing Gardens because an archway like this beckons you, it calls you to enter. So we'll go toward the house. But then again, we'll turn around and we'll look toward the other direction. And it simply tells you to come and walk through. On either side, I have a, another Sweet Autumn Clematis. And then on this side, I have a William Baffin Climbing Rose, which is still blooming. 
and interspersed in this there are several pathways which also beckon you. A little pathway, stone pathway down here right through the flowers. One of the stones, the flagstones, has a, a word on here that has great meaning to me. I'll brush off the dirt here so you can see. And it's very well worn and it's one of the first stepping stones that I put down and it says, hopefully you can read it, trust. <laughs> if you look across the yard from that great box elder tree, hanging from one of the branches is a tree swing. If you are lucky enough to have a tree like that or a tree that would support a tree swing, I highly recommend it. That is one of my favorite places to be. So in this section I just kept adding with another stone path and if you have room and you love birds consider feeding the birds. I have bird feeder here and then several off, off the patio. It is so much fun to see the birds. And another accent piece I have is this concrete statue of a woman which was another birth, was, was a birthday present from my husband. And her expression is an expression I see on people's faces when they come here. And when people come to workshops and on retreat and when they're out in the gardens. And I think that is exactly where I want to be and where I find myself many times. Just soaking in the sun and soaking in the beauty, in the beauty of nature. And I would like to just leave you with a thought. You know, a, a healthy healing garden is very much like a balanced, healed human. Because a healing garden is always fluid. It's always changing and growing and it's transforming. And so I suggest to you that you leave in your healing garden just a little space that maybe each year you can create something new or plant something new, something a little different in form and in color. And that feeds your creative soul. So I thank you for being with me this morning. I hope that you will all come and visit. You know, during this COVID time, we have changed our hours in, in that. Instead of having a set date, which we still have, the second Sunday of every month from May through October, from 11 to 4, people can come to the gardens and stay all day if they like. However, you can also text me or call me, and you can come any time of the day or week if I'm here. So I invite you to come come and visit, and I thank you. Mm -hmm.